in late August 1954 at the Air Flight Test Center of the United States Air Force at Edwards, California, that's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. This experimental plane, the X-1A, was dropped from the belly of a B-29 to attain a new altitude record. In fact, we can't even tell you, we're not allowed to tell you how high it was, but it went above 85,000 feet. And this plane was flown by a young man named Major Arthur Murray. He's an experimental test pilot with the Air Force Research and Development Command. And he's a quiet, self-sufficient man. He's the kind of young man who, 90 years ago, would have been riding the Pony Express from St. Joe to Sacramento. Now, you know, in those days, your trouble started and your blood began to tingle where the frontier began. To young men like Major Murray, the new frontier is 63,000 feet altitude. That's the point where the outside pressure gives out and human blood literally begins to boil. Well, he went 22,000 feet above that. So, uh, all things considered, we are very happy to say, here is Major Arthur Murray. Thank you. In the Air Research and Development Command, our job is to accomplish all the phases necessary for the testing and the development of superior air weapons. The problems I encountered in flying this rocket-powered experimental airplane are the same problems that aeronautical experimenters have always faced. First, the problem is to generate enough thrust or push from the engine to get airborne and stay airborne. Second, the problem is to control the airplane once you are aloft. Now, man's attempt to do this goes back thousands of years. Chinese were flying kites as early as 600 A.D. These kites arrived in Europe early in the 16th century. In 1804, Sir George Cayley turned a kite into a glider. In his glider, power was supplied by rising air currents and by the force of gravity, which pulled the glider downwards and forward. Sir George soon found that without rising air currents, the glider fell to the ground, and that sustained flight would require the application of power to propel the airplane. He already knew that the Chinese flying top would give a vertical thrust, and he thought that the same top could be made to provide a steady horizontal thrust if only he could find a light enough source of power. In 1844, a Mr. Stringfellow provided a small steam engine to drive the twin air screws of a miniature flying machine designed by a Mr. Henson. Long before the model was ready, Mr. Henson began to dream of World Airways. The public laughed at him. After all, it was only a model which made the first successful power-driven flight in 1848. These experiments with models had proved that a rigid wing could provide sufficient lift to support the airplane's weight provided it had given enough thrust to overcome drag. Now, the fundamental problems of flight remain the same today. They can be illustrated with this cutaway section of a wing or airfoil section that was typical of the 1906 to 1916 era. In order to support the weight of the airplane, sufficient thrust is applied to pull the wing through the air. As the air passes over the upper surface, it travels faster. This causes a decrease in air pressure, lift results, and the wing rises. But as the wing meets the airstream at different angles, this low pressure area moves backward and forward. This causes instability. Now, this problem of instability had to be solved by the early airmen before much progress could be made. 
Lilienthal led the way with his fixed wing glider, controlling the machine by shifting his own weight. Chanute added the movable control surfaces, which we now call rudder and elevator, but he still lacked control of lateral stability. The Wright brothers adopted rudder and elevator and secured lateral stability by warping the wingtips. They were now satisfied that they had full control of their machine in the air. The moment had come for attempting powered flight. The world in general was still unimpressed. That first historic flight on December 17, 1903, lasted only 12 seconds. Three years later, they could stay in the air for half an hour or so. But so little was heard of their achievements that a newspaper could say, quote, all attempts at artificial aviation are not only dangerous to human life, but foredoomed to failure, unquote. Wilbur Wright took his machine to France in 1908. He found several promising designs there. By and large, European pioneers thought that an airplane should fly level of its own accord, but their tractor monoplanes and wheeled undercarriages were new. After watching some of Wright's bank turn, Europeans began to change their minds about inherent stability and maneuverability. It was evident that the pilot must have three controls, even if he needed three hands and both feet. So the aileron was born, and the joystick. At this stage, the small underpowered aircraft offered less drag in monoplane form, but for many years, the stronger wing structure and lighter wing loading of the biplane were decisive factors. Very soon, the best features of each type were combined in the tractor biplane. Here, the lightly loaded and stronger wing of the biplane was made possible by the integration of the spars, the interplane struts, and the flying wires into a box-type structure. Now, this was stronger and more efficient than the Wright Brothers airplane, which flew about 30 miles per hour on 15 horsepower. The lesser drag of the flying wires, combined with the streamlined fuselage, permitted this 300 horsepower engine to propel the airplane at about 115 miles per hour. If the airplane banked, or hitched, or yawed, the pilot was able to recover by use of the aileron, the elevator, or the rudder.